update, Mr. Harris. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I assume everybody's in the mood to talk about revenues now, so we will get started. Uh, you know, I've got my my peer here. He's downstairs. As uh, as we always talk about, the process is uh, ongoing, so we got some late breaking news just uh, during the last work sessions. So he's downstairs trying to uh, process that and uh, decipher it for you all. So we, he will rejoin me at some point, but he's uh, he is not out getting sandwich. He is uh, <laughs> he is doing some work downstairs in his trusty spreadsheets. Um, this is a, a a hodgepodge of topics, but again, as we go through the process, I think it's, it's always vital to share with you all the m most up-to-date information that we have. So we're going to hit, I won't go through everything that's on here, read it to you right now because we've touched on all these things, but suffice to say, we're not going to drill down too deep in any topic, but I think we'll give you a pretty good sense of where we are. And really tried today is m mostly about setting the stage for March 13th in this room when we go through the county administrator's proposed budget. So today is a lot of whys, uh, not a whole lot of specifics or details in terms of what that's going to look like on the 13th. But I think the, the backdrop, the context is vitally important from my perspective to help everyone understand how we arrive uh, where we are on the 13th. So I'll kick it off on the, on the revenue side. Again, we've talked a lot about sort of with, this, with the one exception of personal property, which we'll get to in just a second. Uh, but, you know, we've showed you sort of the results. But, again, I, I think it's helpful to take a step back when we're looking at the revenue side because you all have decisions to make, um, some tonight, which we'll touch on a little bit, but certainly as you get closer to adoption in April. So this is looking, I asked staff to kind of go back over the last five years and say, where does revenue growth come from because again you all have getting lots of uh you know messages and cards and congratulations about the assessment topic i've, I've got my uh my top guy here mr bloomfield it happens to be any questions in that space um, but if you look at it over a five-year period of time we really have three primary revenue engines that fuel everything that we do everything that you've seen today and everything you'll hear about tonight comes from really from those three sources 97 percent of growth over the last five years from those three sources. And if depending on what period of time you pick, the number will bounce around a little bit, but it's going to be predominantly from those three. Uh, per real property being the dominant one there at 70%, and then followed by personal property or vehicles, and then sales tax. So those those are the, the big three. That That's really the main point here. We talked about uh, the land book. You, you So you know, again, those results. It looks very, very similar, just to refresh your memory very quickly, to what happened one year ago. We do this on an annual basis. Uh, the residential reval was almost identical to the year before. Uh, we got you know contributions from new growth, both residential and commercial, and commercial revaluations for existing commercial property are also positive in almost every single category. Uh, the two that had a, a slight drag on the overall numbers our office space, which I think everybody understands that general story, and the multifamily, which I want to drill into uh, in just a second because there, there's been some, some back and forth on that topic. But let's look just, again, context, taking a longer view of things. This is residential reval over the last 20 years, really divided into two periods. Um, you see the, the bubble that forms there on the far left-hand side. That bubble burst uh, during the Great Recession, five straight years of declining, you know, activity of results here for us in, in Chesterfield County, not unlike what we saw you know, throughout the region. And then this last, you know, decade or so has really been marked by two periods, eight straight years of reval activity that was below our long run average. And you can see what you're seeing, the two bars for each year, one is just the nominal number, and then we just simply for demonstration purposes subtract uh, the the core rate of inflation off of that so what you know what's in terms of real growth because we are facing those costs uh, you all are, are well aware of that and then the last three years we've been a little bit accelerated over our long run average but if you look uh, at the the two green arrows and right below there the nominal growth over the last 10 plus years is only five percent when you you know, sort of wipe through the uh, the ups and downs of the previous 10 years, it's three and a half. And then the adjusted or real growth rates, 1.1, 2.4. So 
there's there's a lot of noise in this series, but ultimately the averages, you know, sort of rule the day. And the last 10 years, you know, we, we, th- we think about the 8% last year and the year before and the associated rate cuts, but we kind of forget about that eight-year period where we were, you know, sort of just edging along on real growth that was 1% to 2%. And, you know, we built up some liabilities during that period, primarily in the compensation space, and we've been, you know, paying those bills more or less in the last couple of years. So, as I mentioned, across the board from a reval, from a real estate perspective, and this this slide is intentionally text-heavy because I think there's a lot of information that I wanted to share here. So, on the multifamily side, I think the, the the story is is simply this: the average assessment for multifamily units in the county did decline slightly for the reval that closed out January of 2024. But again, none of the things in this slide deck or anything that we're talking about can be taken in a one-year snapshot. So if you look at kind of come down to that third point, the median increase for a multifamily unit and we, we pick median for a specific reason 43 percent over the course of the last three years a single family home is 28 29 percent so you get a little bit of give back on the multifamily space uh, for the work that mr bloomfield and his team have just completed but you saw some very large increases particularly one year ago uh, in the multifamily space and when you average it all out over the last three years where we've seen those three larger numbers multifamily is far far ahead of of single family in terms of median increase and you see the total average increase uh, for multifamily is well over 50 percent so you're seeing the market sort of uh, you know come back to equilibrium a little bit the middle part of this slide comes from some observations this is not matt's opinion or even mel's opinion these are from costar you know, one of our trusted groups. But if you look at the multifamily space, vacancies, and these are metro region for Central Virginia uh, observations. But vacancies are up. Rents have been flat. Rent growth over the course of the last year is the lowest it's been uh, in 10 years. There is a, as you all, I think, are, are well aware of, there's a lot of inventory, not just in Chesterfield County, but region-wide, and this market does not, you know, stop at the borders. All the market forces here are, you know, reliant on what's going on in other localities. There's a lot of supply coming on. Uh, concessions, 25% of communities are reporting some sort of rent concession in 2023. That was only 5% in 2021. And investment activity, there's just less sales. Uh, you know, that's been down considerably. I think uh, the report I read was 40 transactions down to 20. So you, you're just seeing this space overall cool off. And I think that's, you know, if you, basic supply and demand, micro, econ 101, you've got a lot of supply that's come onto the market. Demand, you know, holding steady to a certain degree, but you're going to see a little give back on the valuation side and that's all that we have seen here however again taking that longer view multifamily values in Chesterfield County up considerably 43 to 53 percent depending on which metric you uh, you want to look at um, a, a couple other Qu- notes here comment or question Matt question, yes sir yes, for yeah, no I know problem. you wrote a roll um, this stands in opposition to what we just heard from Mr. Burton with regard to that rents are actually going up. Um, so I'm confused as to, you're saying that they've been effectively flat or going down, but Mr. Burton was just here a second ago saying, or an hour ago, saying that um, they're actually going up. So I, I've, I'm i confused. Oh, uh, this is this is you know real-time data really through the, up to the end of the year. I can't speak, I, I don't know his data set. Um, but if I, it went up, he said it went up about three hundred dollars over a time frame, and what you're saying is that that might be true, but today it's not going up. So I don't know that you actually disagreed in what you were saying. His data may not have caught up with him. I, I, I think that's that's often you know what we see, but I think mm-hmm. from the, the all the reports that we have, Mr. Bluefields here. You know this this story is is consistent, and this is this is actual you know co-star data that's plugged in from real deals and real complexes throughout the region. So I, I think we have uh, every reason to believe it. And Thank you. The, yes, sir. Go ahead. 
Um, I yes, just want to make a point. Please. What what you're talking about, Mr. Miller, or Dr. Miller, is that he mentioned from 2020 to now. He's talking about, I'm not talking about one year. We're doing one year opposed to a three, four-year period. So, yeah, over that period, it did go up considerably amount. Absolutely. And, and, and that that's what I thought I heard him say. And, yeah. and, and this is not saying that rents went down, but the growth is was – you know, basically flat for 2023. This is through the third quarter of the year. And with the supply over 4,000 units expected coming online region wide, you know, I mean, again, basic economics, that's going to put downward pressure on rich. You just can't extract the same rents, you know, out of those units as you've been able to. Uh, Mr. Bloomfield provided that second to last bullet there. 60% of the complexes have uh, appealed their assessment in the last two years, given that large increase in in assessments so it, it's been a very busy uh, space they have looked at this you know in in, in depth uh, way to make sure that they are in the right spot and then i think just uh, you know another thing that we hear because you know chesapeake has added a good number of units but if you look at again the co-star data you know we are still ten thousand plus units behind uh henrico in terms of apartments so um you know we had a long ways to to go uh, we have way more population than they do, but you know, in terms of this particular part of our housing stock, you know, we we, we don't really resemble them in, in any major way. What well, I just said. So, if that is the case, and and so why would like with the stations that sold for sixty million dollars, uh, what six months ago? Not even four months. But they're only valued at 42 million. So again, so why would someone in, and there's been two other ones um, that have sold as well recently within the last. So all of this is within four or five months. Why are people coming to buy those developments if it's not a lucrative business right now? Well, in fact, it is. It, 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 it's still a one asset class that, 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 that is still growing. That particular property that you're speaking about, which was an LIH. L I H T C type property. Now, what what was in the deal? One, it was a deed of assumption, so, so they assume somebody else's um, loan. What will motivate them, and what motivated them to pay more for the property? It, it was an investment decision. Had nothing to really do with from what we saw in terms of the actual income that that, that was producing. So, so, in that particular property, also we also had an appeal on that property as well. In, in, in 2022, so they actually gave us actual rent data, actual data, actual expense data, which is what we actually um, um, determined that on. So wh why they paid additional amount for it, um, that's uh, a I business decision. I actually did uh, hear from them, and the reason why they said that the people that bought it paid more is because when they assumed the loan, they got it at a much reduced interest rate and they paid the additional money to be able to assume something at a lower interest rate, which overall, down the road, the big picture, made it more valuable to them that didn't necessarily have to do with the value of the property. It had to do with the value of the investment yeah. over the interest rate that they were able to purchase it at, it, which it, made more sense. And then vacancies are up 2%, which um, does set, start to say, hey, why do we need more units? But when vacancies were, I mean, when occupancy was at 98% and most apartment complexes want to be at around 92%, um, you're going to see a strain. And so even at 96%, where it's going up 2% in occupancy, it's still a very strong occupancy rate. So um, right. I think that <laughs> everything has to be looked at on both sides. So um, I, I honestly don't like the fact that apartments – have gone down. I think I've shared that with you. Um, but that doesn't take away reality in the data that you have to analyze to come up with the value. I mean, I, I can tell you that, you know, Mr. Bluefield is, is on Johnny on the spot when they have, you know, headlines like that. And, you know, his message to me is always you can't just look at the headline and the total number that gets reported in the newspaper and decide whether how that matches up with what we have in the system in that instance you're right they paid a premium because of the underlying conditions of the deal and it's not apples apples you can't just look at the at the headline unfortunately and and like you know again i can't stress it enough you got an average decrease for 2024 of 0.3% for multifamily so and it's 40 to 50% increases over 3 years so we, this has been a space that they have been through like i said they have they have had to 
answer the bell on this with 60% of the complexes coming in for an assessment. Um, that When they go through that part of the process, and Mr. Bloomfield can correct me if I'm wrong, they really get all of the nitty-gritty and the actual information, and that really helps them to dial it in. When you come in for assessment, you have to you know, show all of your work, if you will, and that has uh, left us in the spot that we're in. But again, the asset class, like you said, still overall healthy, heading in, in a good direction. And it's, you know, if you take the longer view, um, like we try to do with all of this stuff, when we're talking about revenues and building budgets, you know, it's, it's a five-year plan. It's a longer-term vision, and, and nothing is different in this space. So. I just another question. I'm looking at, the, can you go back to the previous? Yeah, pipeline of units, 4,000 plus metro wide to place further downward pressure. Is that counted into the calculus um, for assessment? Um, no, and not, not because the assessments are on, on a yearly, yearly basis. So whatever's happening, whatever's going to happen in the future, we will take that into consideration next year. So, okay. so we took consideration what the performance of the properties were for this particular cycle. So it doesn't necessarily negate what, what's going to happen next year, the year after that. Right. So th th that that's not part of your calculus, no. right? No. Um, because we don't know when they're going to come out of the Correct. ground. We have some that have been sitting around since 2005. So this Correct. is and I answered that. So, we, yeah. we actually sent you some, um, yeah. um, some information on that problem as okay. well. I, this, that 4,000 is a, is a live number. For, again, that, that's, a, that's a co-star figure. This is not our housing pipeline. This is a metro area number. So th these are actual deliveries that will occur uh, you know, within the next six to nine months. They'd probably have building permits. They, 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 that's right. What they, they're it's, it's, is, yeah, it is not a it's it's not a guess at that level. So, uh, just a couple other notes on on apartments again, because you know we get uh, you know various questions from time to time. This is really a follow up from Mr. Engel from last meeting, because uh, we looked at you know student generation factor from apartments, and your question was, well, you know, dive in, slice the data a little bit finer to see what the new units that have been coming online the last zero to ten years, which have been smaller units. Uh, higher end, really targeted towards, you know, seniors, retirees, and maybe some, you know, f first job getting out of college. And you see there are 0.15 student per unit at that zero to 10. And there are a lot of units. That's our second largest unit column, if you will, versus a 40-year-old uh, unit, which is almost 0.6 students. So four times what you're seeing in this new product that's being delivered pretty consistent across the the middle part of the range but certainly the way that multifamily has performed and, and, and has approached the market the last several years is generating a much different result and this is what stratus showed us and certainly uh, when we you know dice it down to this way we, we get a very similar result so um last multifamily slide just a, a little uh break here but this kind of mr miller dr miller this gets to your point this looks at the percentage of building permits that are from multifamily. so again i'm a context guy i'm a longer range guy yep we've seen some spikes the last couple years some higher numbers but it's not terribly dissimilar from patterns that we have seen happen over the prior 20 years so Yes, we're living through something where we're seeing a little more multifamily delivered, but it, this is not something that we haven't done uh, before in Chesterfield County. You see a very similar pattern back there, you know, right before uh, the recession kicks in. Uh, what the, the budget folks did is they went through that housing pipeline strategy data and said, okay, well, what is in there for multifamily deliveries over the next one to two, three to five, and at least five to 15, sort of even a longer range? So there is some stuff sitting in that pipeline from one to two, but if you look out beyond that, you know, the multifamily falls back down to, you know, they, they show very, very little in terms of new units coming out beyond that one to two, suggesting that, it, you know, it's just been sort of a, a market correction. There was an opportunity to some, extract some rents there. Product got delivered. Market has uh, calibrated. And, and here we are. So I think that's a, and just an interesting note to throw in. So sort of back to the revenue picture. Sorry, yes, sir. Again, I'm so sorry. That's all right. Um, what um, I want to call the 500 pound gorilla in the room. Okay. Okay. The 500 pound gorilla in the room is that my kids, I have a great number of constituents that have said to me that the reason 
that the real estate has been so much greater than the commercial is because Chesterfield County has been selling out to the developers. I'm just going to say straight up, that's what the the underlying point is, right? I can see Mr. Winfield's laughing, right? That's the underlying thing, which that's whatever they're saying. And so I, I would like to make uh, provide um, when we continue to have these conversations is that that's not what's going on. This is exactly what's going on because we're working with numbers that are outside of that. But unfortunately, that's the prevailing belief. So uh, I, I, I want to speak to that to at least we're putting it out there on the well, table. And, and, and that's why, you know, I, I put in this presentation today because the, the, the actual numbers, when you look at it from a, a longer perspective, don't you know, speak any truth to that narrative. So I'm, I'm sorry that it has to, you know, to die here today. But if you look at the way that multifamily has been treated versus single family, it, it certainly has uh, seen a much sharper increase over the last several years. So that that's just the the absolute facts of it. Um, so so you know, kind of again, walk through those big three revenue sources. Uh, that's real property. This is getting to personal property, Mr. Ingle. You and I have had a lot of conversations. Um, we got information from the commissioner today. I don't know if Gerard has any any updates. He doesn't look like he wants to give any updates. But bottom line is, these this is a national this is a national data set. This is not Chesterfield, but uh, they are still prices are still adjusting. Again, markets they they have a correction. We are processing that here. We saw a very small correction. We just talked about a multifamily. It's no different. Um, so we do expect that. I think the statistic we got. In, during this meeting from the commissioner is that 99% of the vehicles that were owned in 2024 and 2023 are going to have a lower assessment for the tax year that you are setting a rate schedule for tonight. So we got good results, solid results on real property. Personal property is going to be a, a, a red number. Now, the one sort of caveat twist there, of course, is I'm talking about tax year 2024. And so that's that's what happens at the tail end of this budget, and then we are forecasting on top of that when we present Dr. Casey's budget on the 25th, but you're going to see an absolute decline from what we have thus far from the commissioner in terms of vehicles. So i got three big revenue sources. One's doing well. One is, is absolutely uh, heading the opposite way. And then our third leg of the stool, sales tax. Uh, we got holiday sales. We didn't have this in our hand last month. And you see a, a real decline year over year percent change holiday sales. So some sputtering. You see some inconsistent results on the far you know, right third of this chart. Um, so you know, we got three main sources, two of which taking on a little bit of water. Real property uh, is doing well, but it is the only one that, uh, that we really got to, to lean on at the moment. And then just toss this in here because I think it's, again, context, taking a longer view, super important. Uh, this is FY 2022 information. This is APA. This is not Gerard or Matt's handiwork. We just take the, the numbers that they do. They clean it up and sanitize it across the state. But if you look at our overall revenue framework, revenue per capita, operating expenditures per capita, tax burden per capita, we are either the lowest in our peer group or right down there uh, you know, at the bottom. So this will change a little bit, you would assume, from some of the real property assessments. But if I showed you a chart of Henrico, Richmond, even Hanover the last couple of years, everybody's results have been you know, pretty much the same. So this will change, but everybody will float up or down. And we are going to remain you know, in terms of that very balanced, very modest overall tax burden uh, that we have here in Chesterfield County. Hey, so, Matt, who's, yes, the, who's the two balls to the right of the green Chesterfield? Handsome Spotsvania. Handsome Spotsvania. Okay, thank you. Can't and this is, this, you know, typically we'll take everything over 100,000 because, you know, you kind of get that economies of scale is our general peer group across the state. So with that said, just, again, a little bit of a revenue framework, three big sources, two, and a little bit of trouble. Um, and now we turn it over and let Mr. Durkin walk you through the expense side. Uh, I'm going to pivot back to revenues really quickly before I get to the expense side. Um, in terms of the broader revenue outlook for 25, right now as we have it, um, I will tell you that it's changed just based on that information I've been looking at. Um, right now the budget is projected to grow between 24 and adopted to 25 proposed of $47 million. Um, 
with the note there that you know to Matt's point earlier points over 96 and a half percent of that is down to real estate taxes on its own you can see the table below has them broken out by the major categories um, I will say that personal property number will change I can't exactly tell you what that number is right now but my staff are working on it as we speak um, sales tax um, you will see there's an increase there to what uh, Matt had just said a few minutes ago holiday sales did come in um, we were not the anomaly statewide they fell about two and a half percent in December for Chesterfield statewide it was down over six percent so we are watching that as a kind of more broader measure of consumer activity in the economy as we move through the next few months um, the other thing I will point out on this table is the other local revenue you'll see the increase there of 8.7 percent that is primarily due to interest income. Um, we have been the beneficiary of the higher interest rates that have been occurring over the last year or so. That is not going to continue beyond fiscal year 2025. We have not programmed it that way. There have been forecasts out there for a reduction in the rates over the next six to 12 months. Um, so that is not a recurring revenue source that we will be continually bank on, but we are accounting for it in fiscal year 25. That's a very good point you make there in regards to that, because I noticed in the the treasury report which we have in our report uh the growth in that area but you're right it will expect we expect it to drop or decline somewhat so it, that's a good deduction and, and, and just a, a process note for pardon me for Ms. schneider's benefit but you know it i think last year when we did this update we got the same email uh you know in terms of the mass valuation of our vehicle fleet so that that just like mr bloomfield does that for real property uh, the commissioner does that for vehicles so that's why the process has to play out that's why we don't you know sit in here and show a proposed budget in february because we're just getting holiday sales we're just getting those vehicle values so what you're seeing play out in real time is, is absolutely how it's supposed to occur um, so best case scenario you got 47 million dollars that's going to come down given what we've just learned today so the the next couple slides are just kind of say okay well where would that money where are their draws where are their calls on that 47 million dollars for things that we already know today so i'm going to let gerard just walk you through these big buckets very quickly yep yeah, um top of the list is personnel um we have programmed a four percent merit in there that complements what is in the schools budget um, for their staff as well. It does include full funding of the 10% increase to public safety starting salaries as well as um, the adjustments throughout the ranks to avoid compression. This is the first full year of that 10%. And then we did get some adjustments to our retirement rates from Virginia Retirement System, unlike the schools system whose rates went down. Ours went up for both general government and for public safety employees. The recurring transfer to schools up at 20 million just for some context last year for fiscal year 25's planning purposes we had 17 that is now up to 20 million dollars each year of the five-year plan debt service um, we issued our combined debt for fiscal year 23 and 24 last year um, that has resulted in an extra payment the market given the interest rates i talked about a few minutes ago also um, we've had to adjust some of our assumptions in there as well to reflect that cost um, tax relief for the elderly and disabled we don't have a lot in there programmed in terms of year-over-year -year increase I know audit and finance mr. Holland you had mentioned about the trend of that program um, it had been going up at a somewhat exponential rate over the last few years it tempered its growth last year um, but we are looking at that program as a whole to see if there's extra or additional relief that we can provide to eligible participants um, and then lastly um, we have a kind of reduction in one-time uses um, we drew on the public safety pay reserve last year just to safeguard ourselves with that 10 percent increase that is not being applied in fiscal year 25 we can bear the full cost of that in our base recurring budget there were some one-time capital projects as well um, that happens every year we have that in the 25 proposal but net overall we are reducing our one-time use. Um, finally, probably the most important in that line is the planned step down of the one-time uses for schools from 15 million to 10 million. So, so no, another way to look at that, you have $47 million, best, $47 million best case scenario today. $38 million is going to these things that you know we could have said in here a year ago and said, these things are going to come. We have to annualize the, the, the public safety pay plan. We gotta do a merit. We know debt service is gonna go up all of these none of these things are a surprise none of these things are necessarily what i would consider to be an enhancement to, to current service levels 
Um, so that being said, as as you've seen with the superintendent's budget, there is a list of things that would be considered additional funding requests is sort of what we call them um, and, and other topics. So this slide kind of goes through and says, OK, well, you got you got nine million dollars left. If you agree with everything on the prior slide from a big picture picture perspective and then this is how that nine million dollars would be sorted out it still leaves unfunded lists on the county side of about 16 million dollars that's very close to what uh, superintendent's looking at um, i'll just touch on a couple of these very quickly i'll let gerard go into a, a bigger point here in a second but um, you've got existing five-year plan items that we set in motion last year that now come into uh into you know, focus for FY25. Existing contractual increases, that's probably the biggest one. So we did have those additional investment dollars that showed up, but that gets eaten up almost entirely and immediately by the fact that CPI is part of a lot of our contracts. Those go up all automatically. There isn't anything we can really do about it. So we get the extra interest dollar, but that goes right back out the door on those CPI increases on, uh, on our major contracts. So Nine million dollars pays for all those things. Still leaves something uh, to fall out of, uh, out of the bottom. Other things to be considered uh, for, and, and, and those become really become seeds for out years of our own five-year planning process. Um, so this table, I realize there's a lot of information on here, but I do think it's worth having it all um, on the one screen. Um, if you look at both our operating and capital needs as an organization as a whole we have about $5.1 billion of unmet needs. Now, the largest component of that are the transportation projects. They are about $4.8 billion of that alone. Mm -hmm. But what you can see from this table is it affects every part of the organization. The first kind of bracket or bucket, if you will, about $7.5 million, these are costs that will not be in the 25 budget, but they are coming as part of the fiscal year 2026 budget. That I can guarantee you today. Um, the ERP system will be coming online. We have some ARPA programs that have been stood up, especially in the fire and emergency medical services sphere. They will all be transitioning to the general fund. The general fund will have to pick those up in fiscal year 2026. That right now is forecasted to be a seven and a half million dollar increase. The second bucket um, are kind of looking over that total five year plan horizon. I referenced the school transfer a few minutes ago going up by $20 million each year cumulatively by the end of this five-year cycle, um, that will be an additional $100 million. If you take out the 20 from 25, that's an additional 80 that will be going to the school system over the five-year plan. Uh, and, and so yeah, let's just take, again, take a step back. I think the, the prior s several slides sort of suggest to you that with the existing rate structure, even though you know we're going to take a hit on personal property in this tax year, you know we can present you a, a pretty reasonable... FY25 budget when we come back in here on the 13th. The point of this slide is really there are a lot of things that are in motion, uh, primarily because of the referendum. The last one on here is is probably the most important thing to, to consider. You have five schools, in addition to that $20 million sort of base transfer that's become sort of the standard practice. You have five schools that don't exist today that are going to exist some point in the next four years, including a high school that has an estimated annual operating cost of $3.5 million. So as you consider primarily your rate decision and, and what the revenue side is going to look like, understanding that you've got two sources that are already sort of, you know, struggling a little bit right now. One's doing pretty well. You can deliver a 25 budget. That's going to be pretty solid. But you do have, for the remainder of the five-year plan that we'll talk to you about, you do have a lot of obligations that are coming on through ARPA, through referendum, through these other things. And we'll go into this more detail on the 13th. But it's just food for thought as you consider those uh, big policy decisions over the next couple of weeks. Uh, that being said, I'll roll through the rest of this pretty quickly. CIP, uh, we'll go through more detail on the 13th. Again, we are looking to accelerate referendum projects where we can, and we're looking to allocate some resources from 25 to be able to do that on county and school side. There are some, uh, the Dale Elementary, you know, being a priority that wasn't part of the referendum, but something we know we have to figure out how to get in there. Also a heavy emphasis on major maintenance and a, and a heavy emphasis on technology. Our new CIO has really helped us to, to focus on that area, and I think you'll see that. Uh, we'll, we'll talk more about the CBTA plan, but certainly, as we've said publicly a couple of times, looking to leverage our local dollars uh, to take care of backlog of road needs uh, throughout this community. Uh, 
Uh, schools update, it, you know, again, big picture. They're still working through the tail end of their process, but it is a fairly boilerplate budget. They're, they're similar to what we t- showed on our side. The revenues that are there uh, get consumed pretty quickly by basic things, compensation, uh, debt service, all those types of things. This is not a budget that is filled with uh, with new initiatives in, in any particular way. It does look like Ms. Spillman would be with you tonight that the Senate finance version uh, does have some better news for schools, but we'll have to wait and see how that all sorts out. Just some details on sort of what those buckets are but again compensation just like it is on our side uh the the high point it's matched up very well we continue to work with schools very very closely uh, on those proposals Uh, there's the existing cip i understand from talking to them today a little bit there might be some changes but again you can see sort of in the middle of that plan five schools that don't exist including uh, the old hundred elementary the dale elementary the western area high school Western Area Elementary and the Western Area Middle School, all of those carry operational load that will easily exceed $10 million a year. Mr. Durkin. So on your agenda tonight, um, and consent agenda specifically, is the um, authorization to advertise the tax rates. Um, the main adjustment you'll see on there is the adjustment to the real estate tax from $0.91 cents to 90 Um I will also say that on your agenda is the authorization to advertise also the utility rates as well. And, and so, you know, again, no changes other than what you've already done. You see the four arrows pointing down because they are all tethered together at that 90 cents. You change one, they, they all change. So that that's what, uh, that's what you're looking at there. Uh, next steps, again, we're back in here with you on the 13th. Uh, that's your multi-hour work session where you will get the details in terms of what the that $47 million or whatever it ends up being, where those would get invested. Uh, you see your full list of town halls, and then budget adoption would occur on April the 10th. Uh, very quickly, Mr. Holland, I, you, you sort of has continued to ask about this, but our workday implementation, um, which is our ERP replacement, the, the board put that in place last year, um, multi, multi-department, county and school project, Suffice to say, it's going very, very well. Uh, I've got some reports that I can send you, but we have a contract with Workday. Accenture is one that is actually on site implementing this. Uh, There's a lot of training going on every single day. HR in particular, under Ms. Selby's leadership, uh, is the tip of the spear getting that put in. Uh, We're looking to standardize processes across county and schools and, and really make it a very, very efficient system. So we're very excited. It's off to a fantastic start. Uh, more to come a- about that as we move forward. Uh, this is the season for budget deliberations, town halls. All that is predicated on the community having good information. So that's what you got in front of you today. This is the PAFR's award-winning 20 20- page version of the CAF or ACFR, sorry. Uh, so you don't have to open that up. Uh, but this, this, this is every year that we've done this, uh, it has won, you know, basically the blue ribbon from GFOA. It's a fantastic resource as you go out talking to folks. Uh, the ACFR is, is not easy to approach. This is, so that's out there now. It's on the website. You've got printed copy in front of you. Our key financial indicator dashboard is up to date every single day. We're incorporating new information. So if you want to look more at the revenue backdrop, what we're facing from an economic force perspective, uh, Mr. Durkin's team keeps us up to date. It's a fantastic, fantastic resource. We don't talk about uh, that enough. Um, with that being said, happy to take any questions before I jump into consent highlights. Any questions, comments? Mr. Carroll, any comments or questions? Well. Not at this time, sir. Thank you. Other supervisors. All right. I think we're okay, Matt.